People have, may have heard of ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Citric acid um, is also found in lemons and limes and things, but traditionally it is made um, in a process of fermentation. If you apply enough citric acid, you're, it's going to get in your soil. It's going to stay in your soil. I want to say it's six to twelve months. It might be. It might be longer than that. But eventually, because it is, it, it does when it dries, it breaks back down into a salt type structure. So it's going to build up in your soil if you use a lot. This will say um, it's a fermented product. Citric acid can cause phytotoxicity because of uh, phytotoxicity. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that means that it's toxic to the the uh, photosynthesis capabilities of your of your plants. Now, the way I look at Dr. Zimes is I don't want to poop on this either. It has its place. Does it work? Yes. How well does it work? Does it work consistently? That'll that'll be up to you to find out. I've had people tell me that it worked in the beginning, then it didn't. Is Dr. Zimes pesticide and fungicide product any different than any of the rest on the market? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. You're here with Holt Crowley and Mark Bowell on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to check us out on Instagram and Facebook and hit the notification for future videos like this. If you haven't checked out our monthly membership, make sure to do so because we have over 110 growers ready and willing to assist you through your growing problems. Let's go ahead and get into the video. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. So I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Holt. Uh, first off, Holt, can you please introduce yourself? Tell us what company you're with. And then also, just because, like I've already said, Holt has one of the highest level of integrities I've ever met around the pesticide fungicide arena, which is there's so much information there, but it's a very untapped, uh, untapped, unspoken uh, area. So because of Holt and his high level of integrity, I've actually started to ask him to come onto the channel and we're going to begin to break down one pesticide and or fungicide at a time so that you guys have a full understanding of what you're putting on your plants and the proper application for these pesticides and fungicides. So Holt, please introduce yourself to the channel. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, my name is Holt Crowder. I work for a company called Organic Shield, and Organic Shield happens to be a pest control or an IPM, and it's a EPA registered uh, IPM, which means it's a little different than some of the other ones in that we actually had to prove our results and the EPA gave us a registration versus some of the other products that um, they may be on exemption list with their ingredients. Very cool. I absolutely love that. Okay, so Holt, thank you so much again for coming onto the channel now, what, for the third or fourth time to help break down these other pesticides and fungicides. Every time I release another one of these videos, people on the comment section are like, oh my God, I never knew that, or I never thought about that. That's so interesting. So let's go ahead and get into now the third pesticide slash fungicide that we commonly see in this industry and see what it's about. So Holt, please take it off, brother. Sure, sure. Today we'll talk about uh, Dr. Zimes. And Mark, thank you for having me on the channel again. I, I always enjoy our discussions. But let's look at the ingredients of Dr. Zimes. So we've got citric acid and other ingredients. And if you let me see if I can zoom it in a little bit for you. Okay, so right here we have citric acid, 0.05% water, yeast, and potassium sorbate. You know, so it's 0.05% citric acid. So first, let's talk about citric acid. People have may have heard of ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Citric acid um, is also found in lemons and limes and things, but traditionally it is made um, in a process of fermentation, and that's that's basically just how they make it. Uh, but some concerns about citric acid. So one, well, let me go back for a second. One thing about Dr. Zoms I'll say that is a little different than some of the other things we've talked about is there's no oils. They do not have oils in this. 0.05% citric acid, we have some water, yeast, and potassium sorbate. So I'm, I'm gonna make a little guess on here that the yeast has to do with the fermentation process as people know that yeast is used in beer and bread and things and fermentation. So I'm sure there's a little bit of residual yeast left over in the process of the fermentation of making the citric acid for the ingredient. Let me hit this thing and talk to show you about citric acid for a second. Now this is from Google. Citric acid has a pH below four. So that means it's very acidic. It's also, let's, I'll just kind of highlight this here for you is potentially corrosive. I mean, as we know, the optimal plant pH uh, growth is anywhere from 5.5 five to 7.5, depending on the plant, things of that nature. So one of the concerns about citric acid that I've mentioned in the past, and I'll bring back up again, is if you apply enough citric acid, you're, it's going to get in your soil. It's going to stay in your soil. I want to say it's six to 12 months. It might be, it might be longer than that. But eventually, because it is, it, it is when it dries, it breaks back down into a salt type structure. So it's going to build up in your soil if you use a lot. Now, if you're just 
throwing your soil or substrate away every time, maybe that's not important to you. If you have a living soil, um, a lot of the guys I know are really big in the organic shoes, living soil with worms and everything else in there. They don't want to upset that, that microbiome. And so, so basically citric acid becomes a concern, sorry, becomes a concern when you uh, do that. Um, so that, that's basically what they're using, but it is good because of the pH. Um, it is, it will kill fungus uh, pretty good. It's like powdery mildew. Like right here, it says eliminates fungus molds mildew. I have no doubt that it does that to some degree. And I think Mark and I've talked about this before, but just because you solve one problem, are you creating more problems for yourself? Absolutely. So let me hit one more ingredient that's on there, the, poly, the, the potassium sorbate. So potassium sorbate is a, a chemical additive. It's basically, let's see, this is how they produce it. It prolongs the shelf life of foods by stopping growth of mold and yeast and fungus. So they're probably doing that also to, to, um, you know, to prevent, uh, to, to keep this in a stable uh, position so it doesn't break down. And it also probably works a little bit to uh, inhibit the growth of mold and you know, yeast and things like that. So it probably, they're using this to counteract the yeast that might be still left in the the, the, situ the final formula. And they're not using a really high dose of citric acid. I've seen other products that have 0.22%, but still that's just kind of, that's basically what they do with it. Do you see the safety data sheet here? Absolutely. Okay, so so this this just kind of tells how it's made. A fermentation product made uh, prior to blend of citric acid says so contains no hazardous chemicals, and and that that may be true depending on what you call hazardous. So when it comes to mixing this, a couple of things I found kind of interesting. Basically, here again, even though this is not an oil, this will say um, it's a fermented product. Citric acid can cause phytotoxicity because of and phytotoxicity. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that means that it's toxic to the, the uh, photosynthesis capabilities of your, of your plants. Oh, so, that's interesting. Yeah. Phy phytotoxic, usually when they, when they, when they come up with um, how much you can put on something, at least when we would dealt with the EPA, when you do your dosing or how strong do you mix your solution before you spray it, there is a, you know, uh, phytotoxicity level. So above this, you don't use it because you can't use this higher concentration because it will, you know, uh, burn the plant. Basically, they have the same thing when they make uh, medications, prescriptions, and stuff. It's like how much of this stuff will kill you. So you know, make enough to kill me and then back it off a little bit, so to speak. They don't really. Uh, so that's basically what phytotoxicity is. Is it dangerous or is it toxic to your plant? And the phyto just means the photosynthesis part is it is toxicity. So. Going back to this, it says uh, uh, can cause phytotoxicity if used in direct sunlight. Not really sure why. I know with the oils, because we've spoken before, the oils will refract it and basically intensify like a magnifying glass to burn the, uh, the leaves. But uh, for some reason, I think they're worried about the phytotoxicity of this. Maybe it has to do with the pH uh, going too low or something. Or it doesn't want you to spray in temperatures over 90 degrees. There again, you know, if you've got your grow lights on and you're indoors, you got to worry about that. So sort of the, one of the downsides of some of the oils and things like this, if it says don't spray in direct sunlight or don't spray with your lights on, is that limits your time of when you can use it. So, you know, that means, oh, I've got to be, I got to get up early in the morning or I got to be late at night or I got to turn the lights off as soon as I get through spraying or something along that. So it's, it's not as uh, convenient as some other products that you don't have to worry about light refraction or light hurting them. And, it, and to me, it's kind of an interesting thought that, you know, plants love light and they want to grow in the light. So why do I want to use something that doesn't like the light? But that's just, that's just my thoughts. No, um, it makes complete sense. It's a cognitive distance reality. So what's yeah. discussing. Yeah. Um, so, so then again, they say, they express, they, uh, suggest spraying in the evenings for no notified phytotoxicity. Now here's something, um, also interesting. I'm going to jump around for a second here, but it says we suggest using water between 70 and 98 degrees. That's kind of a rarity thing. You, you don't really hear of using, you know, you need a certain temperature of your water. I, I think it has to do with the, uh, the solubility that it helps it mix better or it helps dilute better for some reason. I'm not really sure why, but, uh, I, I that makes sense it, to me, actually. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's, uh, it's the only thing I've come up with is something along that those range. But then it even says you need to, you know, you might want to adjust your pH to six or seven before you add that, you know, just to make sure you're, you're not getting too, fight, you're getting the, too acidic in there. Anyway, and then after you put the eliminator in, basically, they don't, if you had really acidic water, like you had low pH water, I guess their concern would be that you know, as we said, citric acid is four or less on the pH scale. So they're probably worried about how low or how acidic it's going to get because then it'll also burn it. So it, essentially, let me, let me see what else I've got here. The, the, let me hit the SDS. So I didn't find anything uh, 
toxic or anything and non-flammable in here because it has very few things in that. Now, the way I look at Dr. Zimes is I don't want to poop on this either. I mean, it has its place. Does it work? Yes. How well does it work? Does it work consistently? That'll, that'll be up for you to find out. I've had people tell me that it worked in the beginning and then it didn't. I don't know if they build a tolerance to it, but uh, as far as safety, it's fairly safe. You, you know, it has such a low amount that they didn't have to apparently have to put anything about um, hurting your eyes like the some of the other products I've seen that have citric acid saying it'll, it'll burn your eyes. But obviously, you don't want to spray anything in your eyes anyway. But going back to the label here, here's what I found interesting, though. On Here's their on, on their solutions, or actually their, let me go back to the dosing, because I believe they were using a lot, and you had to use a lot. Here it is. Application rates, they suggest a half a cup per gallon of warm water. A half a cup is, you know, that's three or four ounces. Sorry, that's like four ounces of your concentrate. So at some point, you're going to go through it pretty fast. A gallon has, you know, I think 128 ounces. So you're only going to get so many gallons of mix per gallon of this. So that's kind of a high concentration rate, I thought, um, that they use a, a cup, one cup or, uh, per gallon of warm water uh, to mix it. So you might be using a lot more. And, and something to look for that I, I kind of notice on these most products are gonna you're gonna see use anywhere from a half uh, a half of ounce to or one percent or two percent or something like that. This is a lot higher concentration you're going with. So that, so to get around that from their cost factor, I thought this was kind of creative. Maybe some people call it sneaky, sneaky or uh, sneaky a little bit. But a strong solution is two and two and a half ounces to thirty ounces of water. Well, thirty ounces of water that's like a quarter of a gallon or a little less than quarter of a gallon. So that's why a cup a gallon or a half a cup, excuse me, a half a cup uh, per gallon is why. So you're just going to go through a lot more. So you might buy something, go, oh, this is a concentrate and I've got a whole gallon of this. But if you took a gallon of something else that you're only using a 1% or a 2% per gallon, it's not going to be as cost effective. Uh, so that's something I kind of looked at because uh, Dr. Zimes, I don't want to poo-poo on it again. It's, it's, it's probably, it's got some good usage. I think it would be better used as a fungicide, in my opinion, than as much for bug control. And I think maybe they found out it did a little bugs too. So they went ahead and made the claim or they can make the claim because again, it's a fit for 25B product. And so we, so you do not have to uh, necessarily validate you know, the studies and be signed off by the EPA to be EPA registered products. So I want people not to get confused between the two. EPA uh, fit for 25B, there's a list of things and I can pull that up for you in a second, Mark, if you want, but everything, everybody else has the EPA registered number. So something to always look for, is there an EPA registered number? Um, because that means they're accountable to the EPA and the government and they had to do the field trials and then have those submitted and have the EPA scientists review and validate and say, yes, you did uh, make your claims and, you, and they do work. So with, with Dr. Zimes, I'm not going to say it doesn't work, but I'm going to say it's, it's, it's kind of hit or miss from what I've heard. Um, and you also might have to be concerned about a buildup or having to rinse off your uh, the leaves afterwards or something of that nature. If you're going to be worried about phytotoxicity, I think they even might have mentioned it somewhere here. There he goes. Always uh, before using, yeah, yeah, because basically they're saying about the phytotoxicity. I thought it had something in here about rinsing it off, but maybe it doesn't. So that's all I really got about Dr. Zimes. It is probably more if you're if you're going to use it, I would say it's probably more day of harvest safe than your oils. Um, I don't think citric acid goes into the plant because once it dries, it's going to crystallize and, and, you know, maybe go in your soil. So I wouldn't worry about it staying on the plant like some of the oils or soaking in the plant like some of the oils. Um, I just don't know how effective it is long-term and, and if it's going to mess up your grow medium or not. Do you have any questions on that, Mark? Hold once again, brother, that was amazing. Just being able to just go through these products, once again, understand what we're putting on it and make a more conscious decision. Because again, when you're having a pesticide problem, you're stressed out. You don't, you don't, you just want to go run in there, grab something off the shelf and, and, and go out there and, and put it on your plants. You don't have time to order a product that's a higher quality, like organic shield, if it's not on their shelves. So at the end of the day, when you have to pick between the 10 or 15 or 20 different pesticides on there, hopefully you might want to pick a product that is like, like we're talking about maybe oils or different reasons. All watch the other three or four pesticide videos in the future ones we uh, we talk about with Holt so that we kind of get into the mindset and the why behind what they're doing so that once again you can make a more conscious decision around what you're putting on your plants and then harvesting that food and giving it to not just the end consumer but your parents your kids and your loved ones Holt um, thank you so much again guys please remember to like share and subscribe have a great grow
let's move on. Let's just any questions here. It says the numbers here are these in parentheses. They're not the targets. That's not what I'm trying to, to get when I formulate. This would, to me, is the highest I would want to go. I would never want to go above 250 parts per million nitrogen, even in veg. That's too much. You know, I'd really more like to see 220 is the most I would do. 